I'm not making any money talking these days. Good Christ, 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 Christ. <laughs> Dick, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. Still am. I guess I am a decent guy because I'm a, a, I'm a fucking jerk, uh, and I'm not a jerk. Apparently, I'm a dick. I'm not an awful guy, but I've just I've done so much ridiculous stuff. Man, I am. Uh, man, I'm an awful guy. Hey, what's happening? Forty year old boy podcast coming to you right now in your face. That's right. Hey, wait. Is the mic? Can you hear that? But I mean, it sounded like it made like a pop, like a. Did I blow into the microphone there? <laughs> folks, Folks, this is what's known as a false start in the business. I don't know if uh, you're ever going to hear this, but who knows? We'll see. I might. I may just continue talking. I may I may stop down. I may stop down because that sounded uh, uh, horrible in my head. Wednesday. It's Wednesday morning? No, it's Wednesday afternoon, 3 o'clock. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, Tuesday morning, and I'm, I'm very angry. I've got to be honest with you, folks. I was very angry that I did not do a Tuesday record. I called. On Monday, I was like, let's do it Wednesday. And uh, our, our friend Lily was like, yeah, it's okay. That sounds fine. Uh, but if I had recorded yesterday at the time we were supposed to record, it would have been smack dab in the middle of an earthquake. And I can't believe I missed that opportunity. <laughs> How great would it have been to be doing a podcast during the earthquake and then still put it out and then uh, uh, and, and to, to roll with it and you folks would have heard. And because I know, because let's face it, when uh, Al Michaels was uh, the guy who was uh, broadcasting during the World Series when there was an earthquake in 1989. And I'll never forget it because they showed Con Jose Canseco running in the outfield. And, uh, and then there was kind of a rumble and you heard people start screaming. And Al Michaels goes, I'll tell you what, folks, we're having an earth. And then he's gone. <laughs> and, uh, and that was fantastic uh, because he's also the do you believe in miracles guy. So now he's got two things that you'll always remember he said. And if I'm talking during a podcast, I, I'm not going to be anywhere nearly uh, nearly as eloquent as Al Michaels during the earthquake, I don't think. There's not going to be any, any do you believe in miracles coming out of me when the earthquake hits. It'd be just, it's like I, forever you would remember the, the California earthquake as, holy fuck, what just happened? That We don't want that happening. I'm glad I didn't do it during the earthquake. I, I go back on what I said. Folks, I'm glad I didn't broadcast during the earthquake. Uh, broadcast, because apparently this is a live telecast, and I don't know. A telecast now. Apparently there are video and pictures involved. Oh, I'm a moron. Uh, so, yeah, but, but we had an earthquake, folks. And uh, those of you who watch the news, uh, anywhere else in the world, heard a 15-second blurb about how there was an earthquake in California and nobody was hurt. <laughs> if you live in California, they're still talking about it. They are relentless. They will not stop covering what they're calling the Chino Hills incident of 2008. I don't understand it. They and they just and they bombard you and there's and nothing happened, folks. Nothing. I'm going to tell you right now, nothing happened. The uh, earthquakes. If you live out here, nobody's used to them. Okay. If anybody says I'm used to them, kick them right in the balls because nobody's used to having an earthquake. Nobody's used to having the earth start shaking out of nowhere and uh, you write it out and you eventually just kind of you go with it. But nobody, there's nobody who's calmly just going, oh, never mind. I hold on. What's that uh, uh, earthquake? Let me get some coffee. No, jackass. This is not a natural event. Don't try to act cool during it. But, it, you know, you don't have to act like a psychopath either. Because uh, my wife works in an office, and she told me there was one girl who's never been in one. And, uh, and so then everybody, you know, told her to dive under her desk. And uh, which you're not supposed... I told Karen, you don't dive under the desk. You guys are all the veterans, and you told the new chick to dive under the desk? Great. So I hope you'll have the long talk with her family when they try to... Exp you have to explain how a light fixture crushed her desk on top of her. And she died. But, you know, you get in a doorway. I've always heard you get in a doorway. That's the rumor that I've always heard. Get in a doorway. And then my buddy, David, yesterday goes, hey, you know what? You're not supposed to get in a doorway. I heard that. You're supposed to lay down in front of a couch. Uh, so when if anything falls, it falls on an angle and you have a little, like, pup tent uh, thing there. Really? Why do some people have to know everything about everything? Can't you just let me stand in a fucking doorway? They've been telling us for years to stand in a doorway, and you come along with the crazy couch pup tent theory? Really? If an earthquake hits, am I going to, I'm, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I have to dive to, in the middle of the living room where I'm completely exposed. I don't understand it. Just let me stand in a goddamn doorway. Well, I don't know who came up with that theory of the, you know what? If the thing falls on an angle, you're fine. If something just falls directly on your fucking head, well, guess what? Then you're dead in front of the couch. Unbelievable. They interview people on the news out here, and it is insanity. 
if they talk to some old, and it's always some old lady they unearth from the desert, you know, who hasn't spoken to anybody in 17 years since her, her husband died of, of scurvy. Scur because he's out in the desert. He doesn't get any fruit. Apparently, he has scurvy because they, even in California, they couldn't get the man an orange. So they talk to some old woman and she's like, ah, I'll tell you what, I couldn't believe it. You know, everything started shaking and it shot the fuck up. Nobody cares that a can of green beans fell on your dog. Put down the phone. All these people reaching out to be talked to. It's just, oh God, you know what? And it wasn't, it was an earthquake and it shook. And, uh, and it was, you know, afterwards you're kind of like, wow, that was kind of cool. Uh, and so they have all these clips on the news of people, you know, at, at city council meetings and at television tapings and it starts shaking and all of them have inevitably the same thing. Whoa, same reaction, but yet they still bombard you with it. They just show you it constantly. It's like, oh man, enough with the earthquake nonsense. And I, I've been in a, a few earthquakes. Uh, the first one I was ever in, ridiculous. I was in, uh, the, a quake, a qu qu what was that a quake? What was that voice? Uh, this is like an 87 was the first one I was ever in. And it was, a, it was huge. It was huge. It threw me out of bed. That's how big it was. Like I was in bed. <laughs> let, me, let me break this down for you, folks. I was in bed. Next thing you know, not in bed. This is my first one ever. I'm actually in bed sleeping and I wake up and I'm fly, I'm moving and I don't know what's happening. And then I get tossed onto the floor and I'm still shaking. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And, uh, uh, and then unbelievably can of green beans fell on my dog. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, finally it stops. And then I'm, you know, sitting there with my cock hanging out, looking around going, what just, that was not what then. And, all, and another thing is it was so strong. All of the car alarms are going off. So I thought a plane crashed. Like I had no idea what happened. Uh, so of course, uh, I, I, I throw on gym shorts. It's 1989. It might've been gym shorts. It could have been bell bottoms. I don't know what was, what was in fashion back then folks. I have no idea. Uh, I was 86, but I threw it on and I ran, I sprinted out of my, uh, 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 apartment down to the apartment of people who I knew. And they were just, and they were like me now. Ah, oh, it's just an earthquake. No big deal. Uh, and I said, no big deal. Uh, I mean, I, it threw me out of bed and they're like, yeah, that was a pretty big one. But then you turn on the news and the best part is all the local news people. They have nothing to talk about because they have, there's no reports yet. See, there's no weather in Southern California. This is their weather when an earthquake happens, like with a tornado warning out in, in, in the Midwest, it, it, you know, they practically fetishize the, the storm warning because the storm warning will come at like 10 AM. They'll be like, Hey, there's a storm four States away. Everybody better be prepared for it. And then you spend the entire day gripping, waiting for a goddamn tornado to show up. And, uh, and I sp say that as the guy who I can callously blow off the earthquake. I am scared to fucking death of the tornado because it has the, it has such a long lead time. Like an earthquake just sort of happens and you have no choice. You got to deal with it and then it's over. But a tornado, like I said, literally you'll wake up, your, your clock radio will go off and they'll be like, oh fuck, I hope you're awake because there's a tornado coming. And uh, you're like, okay, that's, that's creepy, but I'll, I, can I even get in the shower? Because then, then you start, you have to measure every decision you make for the rest of the day because you don't want to be caught in that situation when the tornado hits <laughs> because they told you it's coming. So you're like, wow, should I take a shower? I don't know, man. If a fucking tornado hits that I'm standing here in the, you know, with uh, my cock hanging out, I, apparently every natural disaster, folks, I'm going to stand around with my cock hanging out. That's just going to happen. And believe me, those around me think that that's the disaster, that I'm standing around with my cock hanging out. They can't believe it. But I, the, your whole decision uh, making process is altered by the fact that a tornado is coming. It, it, they, act, they practically make it sound like it's sneaking up on you. Like it, it, it might as well be wearing a hockey mask and carrying a machete, quite frankly, this tornado. Because that's how fucking much terror it has driven into my heart and other people's hearts. I'm, I'm, you know, so then you don't, and you don't even want to use the bathroom. Because like, really, I'm going I'm to taking a shit and then the fucking tornado is going to blast me. I, I have a great fear apparently of being caught uh, at, naked doing anything, folks. <laughs> Partic particularly during a national emergency. I can tell you on 9-11, I didn't fucking move. It happened and I was like, all right, if they drive a plane in my apartment complex, the last thing I want to be is standing around my cock hanging out. That was the Initially, that's where I went. Everybody said, oh my God, it's a tragedy. What's happened in New York? Are you aware of that? And I said, holy, holy fuck, what if it happens here? I better keep my pants on at all times. The last thing I want to do is have my dork flying around while people are sitting, smashing planes into me. So <laughs> apparently that is my greatest fear. Uh, but yeah, the tornado drives me insane, man. I, I, I literally... I will be frightened of a tornado. I've been so scared of a tornado that I've actually pondered the regrets of my life waiting for it to come. That's how <laughs> terrible it is because they warn you that it's coming. Again, earthquake just comes out of nowhere. I've been in a few of them now. One time, 
uh, here's here's the difference. Like I said, a tornado, you sit there and fret and you're, and you're freaking out. And any black cloud, you look up and you're like, wait, is there a funnel? Is that a funnel? I don't know if that's a funnel. Uh, but earthquake just happens and you have no choice but to deal with it. I was, so, I was in the movie theater once seeing Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is a great movie. Karen and I are in the theater. We're watching it. And uh, but I would say about a half hour into the movie, earthquake hits the theater. And like and in a theater, it's weird. Like in your house, you hear a rumble and you start to get thrown around. But if you're in a big building that has acoustics, it sounds cr- it. You always think it's the biggest earthquake that ever happened because everything is shaking. The screen, all the lights are flickering. It, it's really a, a, a crazy experience. So I'm in there watching Crouching Tiger. I'm with Karen. And it hits, and the movie keeps playing, and then it kind of gets skewed, and then it does that, and it stops. And uh, and we're all sitting there, and they turn the lights on, and there's that, you can always see the amateurs who are there, because there are people who've been through them, like Karen and I had been through a couple at that point. And, uh, oh, and Karen's Karen's first was a beaut. Karen first, she first felt one when she was applying for a job at Disney. But her second big one, the second one, her first big one, her second earthquake, we had come home late at night and she went to bed. It was like 1.30 in the morning. You know, this is going to go to what I said. It's, she goes to bed and I'm up on, uh, this is how old this is. I'm on AOL, <laughs> dial up AOL, looking I'm sure at baseball scores or some other nonsense. And uh, earthquake hits. And it's, and it's a good one. I mean, it, we're shaking pretty good in, in the house. And I go in and I get Karen and I go, Karen, you need to get up. There's an earthquake. You need to get in the doorway. Because uh, I, I didn't know at the time about this new uh, couch lay in front of a couch and have uh, all of your drywall fall on top of you and, and uh, save you. I don't, well, what the hell? Who thought of that? Seriously, you'll fall there. It'll go on an angle. It'll be great. Really? Okay. I, what if the safe that's in my bedroom falls on my head? First of all, I don't have a bedroom upstairs. Second of all, I don't own a safe. I don't know where that came from. Uh, but Karen, so I make Karen get out of bed. She's completely naked and she gets in the doorway and she's standing there and I've got the doors and windows open. So... <laughs> She's standing, and she's half asleep. She doesn't know anything. So quite frankly, she, I could just be shaking the bed, going, get out of the bed. It's, it's crazy. Just to make her stand naked in a doorway. I could be. And uh, uh, it, it's such a crazy earthquake that it, it, go, it went on for about 45 seconds, which is long, folks. And uh, out in the courtyard of my uh, apartment building, the pool is splashing water everywhere. It's, fly, it's coming out of the pool. That's, it was a good shake. So Karen is just standing in the doorway naked and vibrating and you know moving back and forth. And, uh, and I, and she's in the doorway and I'm like, wait a minute, I got to get in a doorway now at this point. But then I'm like, well, I'm just going to stand in the doorway with her because she's naked. I got to block, you know, what if people go running out in panic out into the courtyard? Because people tend to do that. Some people don't go for the doorway. (laughs) Some people aren't down with the couch plan. And some people aren't down with the doorway. Some people are down with the running outside screaming, oh my God, what's happening plan. And some of those people lived in my building at the time. Uh, so I had to make sure I blocked uh, young Karen. Nobody wants to see her standing there uh, uh, naked and shaken, although I do. And by the way, how great is that a name for an album, Naked and Shaken? Oh, man. You know, that's that might be my first CD, Naked and Shaken. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, this is episode 19, too, isn't it, right? Paul Hardcastle, little episode 19. Uh, so, yeah, so Karen was naked and shaken, and then, uh, and then the earthquake ended. And then she kind of woke up. It was almost like she was hypnotized. And uh, she wakes up and she looks at, and she looks at me. And she's like, "What? What's happening? What was was that an earthquake?" Oh yeah. Hey, put some clothes on. What are you doing, standing around, showing your uh, everybody your things, your things? I'm a child. And uh, uh, so then she just went back to bed. But uh, but but then I had to listen to the people in my courtyard. Just you know, they always have that really brilliant conversation. Of, wow, how big do you think that one was? Well, I don't know. Well, how big do you think it was? Well, I don't know. Somebody go get Larry. He's laying in front of the couch. Uh, but yeah, they inevitably, they just, so the earthquake happened and I'm so mad that I didn't record yesterday because I would have been, I would literally, that was the time we were supposed to be doing it. And, uh, we would have been able to, uh, uh, tell you folks what was shaking in, uh, in Lily's house and what had, what was moving. <laughs> oh, and I would have told you if some sort of, uh, if, a if a Butterfinger bar would have fallen from the cabinet. <laughs> People out here is so weird. It, it's just an extension of their self-involvement that they all feel they got to line up. And Karen taped this for me. She taped me, uh. They were interviewing some kids at a school, and uh, uh, they they asked this girl. They said, "Well, what what happened?" She goes, "Well, I tell you what. You know what? The earthquake just started, and our teacher he didn't even know what to do. Our teacher just went, it's an earthquake,' and then we ran out the class and we ran outside. And uh, and the guy goes, and so like she's trying to spin it into a like the teacher was at fault. 
like he knew the earthquake was coming and didn't warn them. Again, it's not like a tornado, folks. Tornado, you can see it coming. It's over the horizon. It comes, uh, it's come lurking for you with like a shotgun around the corner. But an earthquake just kind of drops in on you. And uh, so I, I, I've got to be honest. If I'm teaching a, a class and an earthquake hits, I think about the extent of my knowledge is going to be, hey, it's an earthquake. That's I'm going to do exactly what that guy did. But then, but she then the, the reporter though smells a story. And she's also tired of talking to people who's a, uh, you know, who had a glass fall off a shelf. So she goes, are you telling me that you don't think the administration was prepared? You don't think the teacher knew what was to do in an earthquake? And she goes, well, I don't think he did. He just said, there's an earthquake. And then we all ran out the class. And, uh, and all I can think of is, boy, I hope that was an English class. <laughs> because that was the day they were going to learn the lesson about how there isn't a word called rant. Well, there is. But it certainly doesn't apply to when you have the action of running out of somewhere. You didn't rant out the class. Uh, I pick, and I'm waiting for the tribunal where this teacher gets brought up on charges over the next few days because, you know, nine parents were like, oh, my God, uh, my, my babies could have died. Uh, but what they didn't realize is this is a classroom. There's no couch to lay in front of. They were doomed from the start. Those kids have no chance. If you're in a school or in a theater or anywhere when an earthquake breaks out, you're just fucking done. You might as well just eat a gun at that point. If you've got one on you, pull it out and just swallow it. Bam. Unless there's a couch handy, you are finished in an earthquake. <laughs> That's the worst logic ever. And just the, the authority my buddy told me where he dropped it on me. He's just like, hey, by the way, you're not supposed to stand in a doorway. I heard you're supposed to stay you're supposed to lay in front of a couch. Really? <laughs> All right. I guess you would know. Uh, the guy who doesn't know anything about earthquakes, at least as far as I knew until this moment when there was an earthquake. It's not like, it's not like all day long, every day, the guy's like cramming for earthquake knowledge. All of a sudden, just when an earthquake hits, he's like, oh, by the way, I know everything about earthquakes. Did I mention that to you? No, you didn't. I'm glad you've dropped that in my lap now. If only I knew before the earthquake all your knowledge. I may have survived it. Quite frankly, I hope another earthquake hits here because I am going to dive under the nearest rubble. Because I don't need to hear your pep talk about what I should be doing. Anything I should do if a mugger shows up? Hey, anything I should do if a know-it-all shows up and tries to kill me with his knowledge? Seriously, tell me, because I really need to know. That might happen someday. Someone might come up and just bury me with information that I don't want or need. I'd like to know how to tunnel my way out of that. Jesus Christ. So we had an earthquake, folks. But everything's fine now. Uh, everything's fine. They're still talking about it, but everything's fine. I'm sure they've got somebody from Lancaster whose mailbox tipped over. So I'm sure they're going to have a chat with them for an hour. It's an hour-long special on the network. And, you know, when you first noticed the mailbox had fallen over, how did it make you feel? It made me feel like jumping out a fucking window. Into the open maw of the earth that had split open during yesterday's prodigious earthquake you won't stop talking about. By the way, nobody was hurt. Nobody anywhere. Oh, God. It's my birthday yesterday, folks. I'll tell you that. That's uh, that, it was funny. My buddy Pat called me today and goes, "God sent you a birthday card yesterday, friend." And I said, uh, "Yeah." But and you know what's funny? He meant it as a joke, but I'm sure somebody like I like because my mother-in-law is crazy religious. I'm sure she thought that at some point. Like, oh, God sent you. Because you know, if Pat says it to me, I know he's goofing around. If my mother-in-law says it, I I get like goosebumps because I know that she means it. Like she really thinks Jesus took notice of my uh, uh <laughs> Jesus took notice of my birthday and decided to break a few windows in Pomona. Like she didn't even think. You know, people think, oh, Jesus sent you a card yesterday, uh, and this didn't even really happen. Why am I making it uh, freakish? My mother-in-law didn't say that. She was very sweet to me. Anyway. But Pat said that to me. But yeah, it was my birthday. And as I wrote, oh, and I, I should tell you, I was in bed when the, when the earthquake hit, by the way. I was in bed and I rolled it, I, I rode it out, like surfed it in the bed. And uh, and because I knew it was that, it's just that thing when you live here, I woke up and I went, oh, it's an earthquake. And then I, you know, got up immediately to call Karen and make sure she was okay. And uh, and then I checked uh, the TV. Like I said, I turned, then I turned on the TV to see if anybody's really hurt. And of course, nobody was. So as I've covered, I think. Did I mention that? Did I, did I talk at all about the earthquake? I don't know if I did. Good <laughs> Christ. Uh, but it was my birthday yesterday, folks. And uh, and there will no, there will be no change in title. The 40-year-old boy will remain the 40-year-old boy. No need to muck it up with another syllable. No one needs to go with the 41-year-old boy. That aesthetically is wrong. It just doesn't make any sense. And I'm not denying getting older. I'm telling you about it now. 
Uh, I know some people, some people who've gotten younger since they've moved out here, quite frankly. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, uh, but they don't listen to the show anyway. But I mean, I, I have friends in the business uh, who have, who I found out were younger than me all of a sudden. I went, really? <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, because I know when you were born and it was before I was born. So I don't know where this new age is coming from. But if it's helping you get guest shots on ER, go right ahead. So <laughs> it was my uh, birthday. So I'm 41. Turned 41 yesterday. I'm 41, but my daddy still calls me baby. A little Delta Dawn for you folks. Here's a song from a million years ago. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 41 years of age. Yesterday, my birthday. And uh, wound up going out to dinner yesterday. I went out uh, with uh, my beautiful wife, Karen, and uh, my young friends, Lily, and her husband, David. And let me tell you something about going out with my wife and Lily. There is never a danger that we're going to drown. Because between my wife's rack and Lily's rack, if there is, if the earthquake hits and it opens up a water main and, there is, and Los Angeles is flooded, I'm going to grab my wife's waist and David's going to grab Lily's waist and we will float around for, I'm going to say, weeks. Just, I mean, literally, we would be suspended. Wherever we were, we would just float. I would hold on to my wife and just float around. Because the two of them are buoyant. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably get, I'm going to guess, uh, let's see, 84 double Ds between the two of them. Uh, 80, that's, that's my guess. Because I know my wife, uh, although my wife will wear the 36, my wife will buy like a 36D bra. And I go, that's great. Where are you going to put the rest of your tits? Because I don't understand why you would buy this bra. And she's like, it's really pretty. I go, sure, it's pretty until your fucking tits destroy it. Until your tits burst out of it like the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> Come on. You wear a 42 double D bra. You just do. I mean, you're not going to get around it. That's what you wear. Uh, you know, but she doesn't matter. She'll buy like some 36 D thing and then she's just shoving and cramming and, and, and they look great. You know, they're fantastic. But you know that bra is furious. That bra is so angry. It's just like, I can't wait to fucking rip. Throw me away now. Good Christ. It's like their their bras are like the levees in in New Orleans. I mean, they're just constantly at 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 threat of bursting. They're just and everything is going to go to hell. It's just going to be a huge fucking tit flood all over the place, and uh, and there will be looting. I know there will be looting. Eventually, eventually those tits are going to burst out and roll forth, and then everybody's going to be looting and then bitching, and we're all going to have to go to the Superdome. That's what's going to happen. But for the time being, while they have them tied up and trussed up and and uh, and and captured, uh, they're a sight to see. I can tell you that, folks. They are prodigious. Uh, but yeah, we the, we walk out and it's like it, it literally. David and I look at each other like, "Fuck!" I you know, we could ride in on them like Cleopatra. Like their their tits are just huge, folks. So there you go. So that it's uh, so we went out and uh, and uh, it was noticeable. Let's put it that way. It was noticeable. <laughs> so we went to we went to dinner. And uh, I didn't know where we were going. I, and But here's how retarded I am, okay? <laughs> I thought we were going to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse because there were a couple of, like, hints dropped. And uh, and I'm a fan of Ruth's Chris. And so in my head, I was already eating a steak. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to go get a steak, and uh, it's going to be good. And, you know, I like a steakhouse because I like when they come out and they uh, and they show you everything raw, and then later it's cooked. That's how weird I am. I, I like the show. I like when they're like, here's a steak the size of a football. You want to eat that? Yes, I do. I'll take that. I'll take some of that raw asparagus. Hey, look at that potato the size of a Volkswagen. Cook that for me as well. <laughs> and Roos Chris is great for that because they bring you all that stuff. And then uh, it's huge. I mean, it's just, and the thing is, it's huge and I can't eat it. I can't eat any, I eat five bites of food, folks, and I'm ready to pass out because I have a stomach the size of an envelope. So, uh, uh, courtesy of a butcher at Cedar sinai He's not a butcher. He was. Like, I told him to do it. <laughs> it's not like it was an accident. It's not like uh, those. Ur- you know those urban legends where somebody wakes up and and he's laying in a bathtub full of ice water and his kidney's gone. That's what happened. Some guy snuck in into the gastric bypass. <laughs> he saw me. He saw me shoveling a pound of pasta in my face at Maggiano's and went, "All right, I got to trail that guy home and do him a favor." And he fucking just pinned me down and and you know a little snip snip and then turned my stomach into a thimble. Uh, and I haven't been the same since, folks. So. Uh, so we go to, so I'm, I got Roos Chris on the brain last night and I'm excited. And then my wife is driving and, uh, I'm a jerk. So she's driving and I'm, I'm like in my head. She, I also told her, don't tell me where we're going. I want a surprise. But then as she's driving, I see that we're not kind of not going toward Roos Chris. So I'm going, Hey, you're going the wrong way. 
because there's a Roos Chris in Pasadena. And then in my head, I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe they go into the Roos Chris in Beverly Hills. <laughs> All right, relax. So then we're driving through Santa Monica, and then my wife gets into a fight with an old man in a Porsche as he flashes his lights at her. And, uh, and my wife's like, you know what? He's a jerk. He flashes lights at me. And then he cut in front of us. I go, flash your lights at him. She goes, I couldn't possibly do that. I'm like, go ahead and do it. She goes, all right. And then my wife is like five years old. She flashes her lights at him. And she's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Like she laughed like, uh, like one of the kids in South Park. She thought it was the funniest thing ever. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got him, huh? You showed him. As he flashed his lights to get around you and get a car length ahead of you, that guy's definitely getting where he needs to go fast. So uh, so we're driving around looking for the Ruth's Chris, and in my head already, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get a filet. No, maybe I'll get a different, uh, maybe i get a, a T-bone. Oh, maybe i go shoulder. Do they even sell a shoulder? I don't know if they do, but it didn't stop me from thinking about eating it. I'm thinking about the entire cow from head to hoof, thinking about what I'm going to suck down for my birthday. Hey, I'm 41. I might, I might just order the tail and some feet. You know what? Just make me a soup out of the head. God damn it, I'm eating that cow. I'm kicking its ass. Uh, but I can't wait. I got steak on the brain and I am ready to just fucking wolf it. And, uh, then my wife, all of a sudden she's in like a neighborhood driving. I'm like, I hope we're not eating at somebody's house. That would be awful. Like, unless the, <laughs> maybe Roos Chris has like a brownstone that they purchased somewhere in Hollywood. And then you can just kind of stop in for a secret meal. Maybe we're going to like a Roos Chris speakeasy and we got to knock on the door and a guy's going to slide a thing and we got to go rainbow. And then he opens it up and lets us in to eat and play poker. I don't know how it works. Uh, who knows? I've asked for a surprise. I'm the worst. I asked for a surprise, and yet the whole time I'm gripping about where the fuck we're going. I'm like, what is happening? I don't, this is not really great. What's it, where are you going? I want a surprise, but I don't want a surprise. I want to be surprised by a non-surprise. So then we drive, and then my wife sees a driveway, and she turns into it, and uh, it's not Roos Chris. And it turns out we're at, a, we're at the hotel uh, down in Hollywood, a hotel called The London. And at The London... There's a new restaurant at the London called Gordon Ramsay at the London. Uh, Gordon Ramsay, celebrity chef, I, uh, who I have a man crush on, who I can't get enough of. Uh, I, I, watch, uh, I watch Hell's Kitchen. I watch Kitchen Nightmares, even though it's horrible. I watch the British Kitchen Nightmares, which is great. Uh, I've watched him on, I've actually watched Regis and Kathy Lee because he was on once. I mean, I sat through that horrible pile of sludge just to see him come out and make a, a turnip. Uh, but that's my guy. Uh, but here's again, folks, my tiny, tiny brain has already been chopping steak from Ruth's Chris. So we pull into the London, Gordon Ramsay. It should be like this crowning achievement where it's an amazing surprise. And I have to admit, I was pissed <laughs> because I am an infant. Because I had already in my head went, oh, I'm going to Ruth's Chris and having a steak. It's going to be so delicious. And then we don't go to Ruth's Chris. And in my head, part of me is even like, oh, man, I hope Ramsay makes steak. Like, I'm mad at Ramsay now. Ramsey's got nothing to do with this. This is an amazing surprise. I, 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 at a restaurant that just opened, the winner of Hell's Kitchen is going to be the executive chef there in September, and it's I can't stop talking about this place. We're finally there, and I'm let down because I'm an idiot. Oh, but you know, you build it up in your head. You're like, oh, Roos Chris, I'm gonna, it's gonna be so great and steak, and I'm, I'm so excited about it. And then we don't go to Roos Chris, and I, I, I guess that she could have pulled onto a boat that was going to heaven and i would have been like god damn it where's my steak by the way i don't know if a boat goes to heaven i don't know what the route would be <laughs> so, i don't even know if it's accessible via waterway i don't know where it is Some bermuda triangle maybe i don't know but there was that moment where i was pissed i was pissed to be going to the gordon ramsay restaurant at the london i was pissed to be surprised what an idiot. What an old man. Ugh. I got over it within within like 10 minutes. But I sat on the couch. Like, it was funny. My wife had to grab a cigarette, and I went into the lobby, and I actually sat in this amazing gold lobby with marble and and fumed on a couch. No, I can't believe that we're here. I wanted to go to Roots Cruise and get a steak. Shut up, faggot. What is wrong with you? Enjoy yourself. Allow yourself to experience something new. And normally I would. I'm that guy. I don't mind that stuff. I love it. But for some reason, I had built it up in my head to where I was going to go. And here's why. I, I will tell you this because I also wanted a birthday cake, folks. I, I had wanted a birthday cake. I, I wanted a birthday cake last year for my 40th birthday. I wanted a peanut butter and jelly birthday cake. Yes, because I'm four years old. I'm a baby. I want balloons and I want people singing to me and I want a birthday cake because I'm stupid. But I wanted one last year and I dropped it on Karen. I casually dropped it thinking because I'm a girl 
Okay, I'm a girl who drops hints thinking that my wife, who's a man, will take them and do something with them. You know what she did with them? Nothing. Uh, Because last year, my birthday, there was supposed to be, I think I've mentioned there was going to be some uh, uh, craziness. But that wound up not happening either. And I didn't get my fucking cake. So it actually became a bone of contention last year about the cake where it was like, uh, I can't believe that I didn't get this peanut butter and jelly cake. And, uh, and like my, I think my wife made like a half-hearted call to a bakery at eight o'clock PM the night before, you know, <laughs> uh, and it was just, it was insane. So I was, I was mad, but then for the past year, I've thought to myself, well, the cool thing is next year, I'm going to get that peanut butter and jelly birthday cake. Cause there's absolutely no way my wife isn't going to make the effort after last year's nonsense. And sure enough, this year, man, I, we, again, I wanted Ruth's Chris, sort of, we wound up at the London and I didn't get the cake. No cake for me. No peanut butter and jelly cake. She didn't even, and again, I didn't even want a cake. You know what I wanted? I wanted effort because I'm apparently a first girlfriend. I didn't care about the cake so much as I wanted the effort of looking for the cake because I have a vagina. <laughs> Oh man. So we go to the we get to the London and after ten minutes of me sitting on a couch going, Can't believe it's not Ruth's Chris and then I didn't get a cake and peanut butter jelly cake and I wanted uh, <laughs> Poor fucking you. That's what I need. I need Livia Soprano to go, Oh, poor you I need her to drop that right in my fucking face, because I am an idiot. So after I snap out of it and we go into the 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 Ramsey uh, restaurant last night. I, I have to tell you, I am obsessed with it. I we ate dinner last night, and it was, un it was the best meal I've ever eaten in my life. They just we ordered food. Karen got Karen and my friend David got the uh, the chef's menu, which is a uh, you know a six course uh, chef's menu where they keep bringing you stuff. We got a sushi tasting. Uh, I ordered, and it was funny. I I made a decision when they got the menu. I said I'm ordering anything weird, <laughs> anything crazy that they got. I'm ordering it. You know what I ordered? A pig's head. I ordered pig's head. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even ask. It said braised pig's head. I said, bring it. I almost wanted them to leave the eyes in it and close one of the eyes in a wink for my birthday. So he's like, ha ha, eat me, buddy. I'm winking at you in a fashion that says happy birthday. And I would just literally, I would French kiss that pig's head. If it came out cooked, if Gordon Ramsay made it, I don't give a fuck. I don't, I'm doing what I don't. And it's funny. I've said before, like I've eaten something and I've been like, oh man, this, this was so good. I wanted to stick my dick in it. Like I've said that about a meal. I got to flip it. This meal was so good. I would have let it fuck me. That's how good this food was last night. I, it was so good then that, that I actually obsessed about it. I went, I went last night and I typed out what we ate. I, because I wanted to, even though I'll remember it, I wanted to actually type it out, uh, like the courses, and I'm I'm trying to fill in the blanks on some of them. But I, uh, but we had a we had pork belly, man. We I ordered this, pork. I, I ordered the pig's head. I ordered everything with pork. It was like it was a night of pork and foie gras. It was uh there. Oh, I got this quail with foie gras with a sherry gastrique and all those words you can't pronounce you're like oh the, uh, oh and they came out and they poured stuff on my food that was great because i ordered squab and it had like a summer corn emulsion and uh, and they poured a, a corn liquid like all over it and it kind of it, it brings it together oh dude i am a food fag i mean i was just so happy i couldn't i and to the point where i i left and i went like i said what, what we were and dinner we at 8 30 reservations we got out of there at midnight because they pace the courses, and uh, and again, there's a wait staff that is ridiculously huge, and because four waiters will bring you your food, because there's four of us, so each a waiter is carrying a different plate, four different waiters, and they huddle up. They actually huddle up. It looks like they're like, all right, you do a button hook and you go long, and I'm going to bring him his cone feet. I mean, it's like that kind of plan, and then they all come together and they and they make sure they they look at each other and they put everything down at once. That was the whole deal. It's all surgical, man. Everything is music. Everything. It was fantastic. It was, and it was the best meal I've ever eaten in my life, which is saying something for crazy fat Jenkins, because I am telling you, I have put away a lot of food in a lot of places. And we went to, uh, last year we went and had dinner at, uh, chef art. I don't know. Oprah's personal chef for, uh, for Christmas. We, I took a, a bunch of my friends out and we went and ate there and it was great food, but, uh, I've been to Bobby Flay's places. I've been to Mario Batali's places. I've been, uh, you know, a bunch of different places. And uh, 
but this meal last night, boy. And I know Ramsey wasn't there cooking it, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just he he was all over it. It had Ramsey sweat in it. It had Ramsey jizz all over that food, and I was like, yes, I'm on. I'm on board. His risotto was unbelievable, and uh, we had a, a pineapple souffle with a Thai curry ice cream, and then they had this orange four-way dessert with a cinnamon ice cream and a rose water sabayon, and yes, I am queer. I don't care. Suck it, folks. Sometimes you don't want to go to In-N-Out. You know, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you want to go to a place where 13 dudes make a pork belly the size of a dice. And yet it's still the, the best and most flavorful thing you've ever eaten in your entire life. Man, it was great. It was so good. So it was so good that I actually, I'm obsessed by it. And I was thinking about going there for lunch. Uh, and in my head, I'm just like, really? You're going to go drop $80 on lunch, you bonehead? <laughs> and I also, I would have no idea where it was because the whole time in the car, I was going, this isn't Roos Chris. This isn't the way to Roos Chris. So I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how to get there. I have no clue. Uh, but it's funny, the Hotel de London used to be the Bellage, I guess. And, uh, and, and, and this is funny, Karen and I, <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to, all right, I got to say this. So we, I, we went to this hotel and this is Karen and I, this is our second visit to that hotel. Uh, the first visit we, I had a show there, uh, in, in a back bar. I mean, I don't even know who was putting on a show in this hotel, the Bellage, it's, but it's down on, uh, Sunset. And uh, so we go and I do the show and it's, it was horrible. There was nobody there. But then Karen and I go to leave. This is six years ago. This is a while ago. Uh, <laughs> she's not going to be thrilled when we tell the story, but I don't care. She doesn't listen to the goddamn show anyway. So I'm sure she's very busy calling around trying to find me a cake. So there's no way that she's going to hear any of this. So uh, we went uh, to this hotel and this, this might be a little graphic, folks. I gotta, I, I'll drop that on you. Uh, uh, I apologize, but, uh, we, we go there and uh, this is the second most decadent experience I've had in this hotel, uh, this dinner last night. The first, uh, I do this show and I'm with Karen and, uh, it's a terrible show. There's nobody there. Uh, but we finish and we go to split and I don't know why we did it, but as we're walking out of the bar, cause it's way deep in the recesses of the hotel. And as we're leaving, we're going to the front lobby to get our car. The elevator opens. And I just, I look at Karen and I go, let's go. So we get on the elevator. And uh, we jump on the elevator and uh, there was a maid there and she was going to the roof. And the thing is you needed to be have a, a guest key to go to the roof. But she was going and uh, she was Portuguese or whatever. So we were just like, you know, she's just like, oh, what floor? And we're like, where are you going? She's like, the roof. We're like, fantastic. So we decided to go to the roof uh, because it's where the pool and stuff is. So we go up there and there's a couple stragglers. Uh, and this is, you know, it's sunset. Uh, Boulevard, it's summer, uh, it's warm out, and it's a pool in Hollywood. I mean, it's just, you know, it was it was something to do. So we go there, we get up on the roof, there's like two people, and uh, they split. So then Karen and I are alone, and uh, there's a hot tub. And uh, I look at Karen, and I go, you want to go in the hot tub? And she's like, what do you mean? And I go, what do you mean, what do I mean? Let's go in the hot tub. And she's like, well, we don't have any uh, suits or anything. I go, that's okay. Let's just, let's go in the hot tub. She, and she looks at me and she says, okay. So I, so I can't believe she's on board with going in the hot tub. So she starts getting undressed uh, on this, on the roof of this hotel. And so do I, sort of. Because you got to remember, I'm still like crazy fat Mike at this time. And, uh, and I'm a little weirded out about uh, taking my clothes off uh, anywhere, even to go to bed. Like, I'm, cause I'm, I'm like, I don't want to expose the world to this horribleness. Uh, but my wife, however, and this is, I should say, you know, my wife and I have always been kind of adventurous and, and done things, you know, we, you know, uh, Hey, there's a golf course. Let's have sex on it. Like that kind of stuff, but never in, in real public. I mean, we've always been, you know, there's always been a locked door. We've always been somewhere else. Uh, but we're on the roof of this hotel and, uh, as witnessed by our presence, pretty much anybody can get up there. Uh, but my, it doesn't stop my wife and my wife strips naked on the roof of this hotel and gets into the hot tub. And I got to tell you folks, uh, my dick has never been harder in its life. I, I uh, honestly, I thought of uh, it. My dick was so hard at that point. I thought of just kind of like smashing it like the Hulk on, on the pool, uh, service and like causing it like rubble to fall in front of the door. So no one else could come out. I mean, it was like that. It was crazy. It was like diamond hard. Like I was like, I can't believe my wife just because like, the fact that she was so on board with it was the best. But then even better, right when she gets completely undressed and gets in the hot tub, five people 
come out to the pool and start coming over to the hot tub. And again, they're, and they're in suits, okay? Uh, uh, Karen's completely naked and in the hot tub, and I'm completely dressed. Because I, because I sat there slack-jawed as my wife took all of her clothes off on a, on a rooftop in a hotel we're not even staying in. I did like an open mic in the bar downstairs. And the next thing I know, I got a naked wife in a hot tub. It's like, yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, these five people come walking up, and, I, and, and Karen looks, and, and I just go, okay, are they going to go in the pool? Nope, coming right for the hot tub. Five dudes. So now this has gone from a crazy private uh, sex thing to, hey, there's Max Hardcore with a camera. Let's make some money. All of a sudden, I'm, in my head, I'm like, all right, this could break bad, but they're in suits and flip-flops. So if I have to fight them and fight our way out of here, I can do it. Uh, I think because then, I, like, literally, that's where my brain goes. My brain goes to, hey, these five guys. It's not, hey, here's five guys staying in the hotel and they want to use the hot tub. It's, how did these five guys know we were up here and are they going to try to pull a train on my wife? Let's go. <laughs> So in my head, I figure out who I'm going to hit first. Who I'm going to hit as Karen, and I'm I'm like, all right, look, if anything happens, just like you know, get dressed or like run and grab your clothes while I'm fighting everybody, and then just get some help, you know, like it's I don't know, because but then part of me also is like, well, you know, this could get interesting if these five dudes show up, and then uh, uh you know, and I don't want anything to happen with them. But at the same time, just the fact that, you know, my wife is there naked and then it's fine. It's, I got to admit, man, it, there's part of me that's going, this is going to be, str- what's going to happen? I don't know if this is going to be good or bad, but something interesting is going to happen here. So these five dudes turn, uh, come walking up. And then as they uh, walk up, they're like, hello, with their German accents. And then I'm like, well, they're Europeans. So they're completely on board with this. They're fine. And, uh. And Karen's naked in the hot tub, and I look at her, and uh, and she just kind of gives me a, a, a look, and she goes, "Michael," and and she says it. I can't do her voice, but she says it with like she's like scared. She's like, "Michael," and I go, "Hey, fellas," uh, and <laughs> imagine this: they're about to like put their they're put their towels down, and they can see my wife, and they see that she's naked in the hot tub. I mean, they know what's happening, but they're you know they're wearing their speedos, and uh, they're German, so they they don't care. They see naked people all the time. They're in Germany. They, I'm sure the place is filled with naked folk. So uh, they see my wife and I'm sitting there, you know, I'm and I'm fat Mike in sweatpants with the raging hard on and his naked wife in the hot tub. And uh, which, by the way, that was my favorite Elton John album of the early 70s. There was Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. And there was fat Mike in sweatpants with his hot wife and in in naked in the hot tub. Those are great albums. So I'm there and uh, and I have to look at these dudes and I go, hey, fellas, uh, we were not expecting company. And my wife needs to put some clothes on. Because I, I didn't want her, like, I was like, all right, let's see, you know, let's see how this plays out. But she made a face like, oh, uh. it was the face. You ever see when Bernadette, all right, in the movie The Jerk, Bernadette Peters is in a restaurant and they bring her escargot and they pull the top off and it's, there's snails on the plate. And she goes, Ew, uh, and she makes these really high pitched like noises and she makes a face like, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's snails on a plate. And uh, that's what Karen was doing. She was like making these little squeak noises like, I'm naked and really vulnerable. Could you help me? So I go, fellas. So I have to, literally, I have to tell the German World Cup team to turn their backs while my wife throws her bra on, and and then and like you know, I have to stand in front of her while she's getting dressed. And they're all, they were very nice and they were pleasant people. And they were like, they were like, it's not a problem. That was my favorite. Like, it's not a problem. And I go, uh, not for you guys, and not for me. I got to be honest. Uh, but my wife apparently would prefer to put some clothes on, so uh, she did. And, uh, and we walk away and the five guys use the hot tub and she's, we, she has no towel. We have no towel. We have nothing. She's just soaked and wet. And, uh, and then she looks at me and, uh, and I'm like, wow, I go, that was, uh, that was pretty crazy. And she's like, come here. And she grabs me and pulls me off. Uh, there's like a little, like a towel cabana place and it pulls me behind it and we go to work <laughs> like within, within a stone's throw of the Germans, uh, you know, someone's bent over a railing oh, and we're looking out at, at, at Hollywood as it's happening and uh, and there's people on the, that can see us and that's another thing there are people you know there's buildings just as tall and we can see them in their windows and if they look you know they can see us and there's but we didn't care my and karen's engine was so revved up at that point and uh, and i forget about it. are you kidding me i'm i'm ready to uh you know cr- safe crack with my cock i'm ready to go so like in the movies when they take that drill bit and they put it through i i would just go ahead and just start running into things with my cock and smashing them down that's how hard it is and uh, uh, and so we go at it on this rooftop, and we can hear the Germans commiserating off in their Germanness, 
and their uh, speedos getting soaked, and we were just and we went at it. Uh, so then when we pulled into this place last night, I was like, wow, I you know this is uh, I remember this place. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was great. Uh, and that was not my birthday. That was uh, that was just kind of a happenstance, folks, just out of nowhere. Uh, so yeah, the l- last night's dinner, second most decadent experience I've had at that hotel. <laughs> Uh, but I was excited. I was thrilled to go, and uh, uh, I'll go back. I don't know if I'll ever go back to Gordon Ramsay's restaurant. This is never going to happen. <laughs> what am I, who am I kidding? I can't go there with the army of waitstaff and then the $8 million for dinner. Jesus. Uh, but boy, was it good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, this week. Uh, oh, and I, so, so I got dinner. I got that for my birthday. And uh, uh, also I got, yes, Rick Springfield's new album, folks. That's right. I got Rick Springfield's new album. But you want it? You do, seriously? Do you want to step up and make something of it? Because I'm happy to go through all of you like a buzz saw. I'm tired of you coming down on me for it. Anybody who's got anything bad to say about Rick can just step up. Punks jump up to get beat down. <laughs> uh, I love Rick Springfield, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. I cannot. I cannot lie, and I won't lie to spare your feelings anymore, folks. You need to embrace my love of Rick Springfield. If you love me, you love Rick. That's just the way it is. I've actually, uh, I'm, I'm excited to get the album, and I've, uh, uh, and now it's funny. Now I, I might, maybe I'll use him as closing music. Maybe I won't. I, I get people, it's funny, people write me all the time, because I don't choose the music for the show until after the show's over, and if something comes up, then I, I wind up doing it. Uh, like, the show will influence whatever music I choose. Um, it's usually going to be a Van Halen song, although i got to be honest, I'm starting to run out of Van Halen songs. I don't, I don't want to. The philosopher that is David Lee Roth doesn't really write a lot of lyrics that lend themselves to describing how I feel because (laughs) Dave is, uh, Dave's, you know, I very rarely are you folks going to see me standing here by the record machine. You know what I mean? Uh, So I keep trying. I mean, it's, I've been lucky. I've been able to find, you know, things that express how I feel or whatever that maybe has a theme. Uh, And then eventually I'm just going to start putting angry guitar in there. I don't even care. Uh, But that's a day. But then the closing thing, People write me all the time and they say, hey, uh, are you going to get in trouble for the, using the music? And I write back, like, I don't know. I don't know if I am or I'm not. All I know is if they want to con- contact me, I'll stop. Uh, I, don't, I don't profit from this show. So the way I see it, it's just me. It's almost like radio. I'm just using it. And uh, if I ever wind up packaging the, the show for something later, then I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, uh, what, what are you doing? Why are you closing your ears and moving your What are you trying to do? No, tell me. I don't know what's happening. I'm, I'm doing this, and Lily covered her ears and started moving her head back and forth. Like, are you say, are you saying you don't want to be involved if there's a if I get sued? I was singing shit in my shoes. Wow, that's how into the show you are. That's how into the show you are. You're singing "She's Tight" from Cheap Trick in your brain. Wow, folks, let me go ahead and say, if anybody wants to produce this show, feel free and contact me. I don't, I, I'm sitting here looking at, I look over at her, she's covering her ears and moving her head back and forth, and I thought, well, she doesn't want to be culpable if there's a lawsuit regarding the music later, so she's going to pretend like she didn't hear this part, and uh, nope, she's singing Cheap Trick songs in her head. <laughs> I must be really fucking interesting. Good Lord. <laughs> so people ask me all the time if I'm, what I'm going to do about the music, and I, I don't, you know, I I'm going to keep playing the music until somebody tells me to stop. And I, honestly, I hope it's the artists themselves. I mean, I, I'm, I'll, I'll just play, uh, you know, because if playing music means Eddie Van Halen calls me and tells me to stop, fantastic. I'm going to play it until the guy gives me a shout. Hey, Eddie, call me up. Let me know what you think. Uh, I actually met Eddie uh, Van Halen. Uh, I met him at a newsstand once, and, uh, and he was, you know, and I got to, uh, and it was funny, I got to give him the uh, 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 I love your work hug. That's what my friends tease me about having. Whenever I meet a guy, I'm always like, uh, uh, man, I enjoy your work. And I'll give him like a hug, like some some celebrity guy, <laughs> if he's on board with the hug. As I've mentioned earlier, that that's what I do. <laughs> but uh, but with Eddie, it wasn't a goof. Like I, I got to tell him it was amazing because I got to tell him because I came into my wedding to Eddie Van Halen music. Like I cut together my favorite guitar parts and Karen and I entered to that, which then turned into uh, 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 Beethoven at the end, uh, which was great. Whatever. Who cares? But um but I, I actually met him and got to talk to him for like 15 minutes and tell a guy what he meant to me and tell him what his music meant to me. And that was really cool. Um, but I gave him the I, I love your work hug, which is what my friends tease me about. I met uh, sometimes it's funny. I met Ice Cube, the rapper, and I gave him like I didn't give him the I love your work hug because I didn't feel that that was going to be appropriate because <laughs> Ice Cube has a song. 
And, and uh, when I met him, I met him right when America's Most Wanted, his first album came out. Uh, I was at the Public Enemy show, and I was working. I, I went two nights in a row. One night I was working security in the pit, and the next night I just went to the show because I had tickets. And it was uh, Public Enemy and Run DMC and Digital Underground and, uh, you know, uh, all the, all these guys. It was great. Uh, and Tupac and it, whatever. It was an amazing show. So uh, I, I'm walking out, and I, I, I've never seen a crowd. You know how they play that incidental music between bands? just over the speaker as they're setting up and tearing down the stage, they play music. They played America's Most Wanted and people sang and jumped up and down. Like they went crazy like he was there. It was So I was like, dude, it was awesome. So then I walked out and I met Cool Mo D and I met all these different people and I saw Ice Cube and I was going to go up to him and, and I didn't know what to say to him because on his album he has a song that's, <laughs> that says, there's a song called Get Off, Get Off His Dick. And, uh, and there's uh, get off his dick and tell your bitch to come here. That's the name of the song. And in the song, he actually sings the the verse. He says, uh, women, you can ride, but men be a man. Shake my hand. Make it a firm shake. Say, yo, what's up, Ice Cube? And then break. Because uh, if you're hanging there, I'm going to make it clear. Get off my dick, nigger, and tell your bitch to come here. So that is literally in my head as I see Ice Cube. So I went up to him. And, uh, and he's just shaking hands with everybody. And I, I'm fat white guy. I walk up, and this is what I did. I like put my hand out, and he shook my hand, and I just went, "Cube, you the roughest." And I walk, and I just left. And I went. I immediately just left. Like I didn't even wait for him to answer or make eye contact because it was like, you know what? Shake his hand, make it a firm shake, say what's up, Ice Cube, and then break. And that was exactly what was in my head. So I just went up and I said, "Cube, you the roughest," and I immediately exited stage left. I know how to deal with Ice Cube. That's how it works. <laughs> that was a million years ago. It was 91, probably, when America's Most Wanted came out. Jesus. Uh, but, yeah, man, if it means that uh, these guys are going to call me, fuck. I'll, you know what? I'll play some of the songs from Chinese Democracy on here. If Axel will give me a call, i would be fine. And you know what's funny? He's the crazy one who would call me. He, I would not, of anybody in the music industry, I would bet that somehow Axel would hear that on my podcast I played a Chinese democracy song and he would fucking call me and tell me that, to, to stop it. Uh, man, I got to see them. Uh, 2006, I got to see them on tour. It was the greatest. All these people were like, it's not really Guns N' Roses. Bullshit. It's Axel. Everybody else is playing the music and that's great. I don't need to see Steven Adler falling down high. They brought Izzy out. That was good enough. Would I have liked to see Slash? Yeah, I would have liked to see Slash. But you know what? Bumblefoot or Buckethead or whoever the fuck he's got playing guitar now was awesome. It was fantastic, man. It opened with this creepy, this guitar, this weird circus music. And then he shows up and he's just like, do you know where the fuck you are? And the place went insane. And I, and again, I was immediately, I was a kid. I was a kid. And he opened. How do you open with Welcome to the Jungle? I mean, because it, it's like in your brain, you're like, that would be so great. It would be so great if they opened with Welcome to the Jungle. But if their biggest hit, there's no way they're going to open with it. Bam. Right in your face. Oh, man. I am so souped up. I apologize. So, yeah, Axel would be the crazy one who would call me. I, I, maybe I do do that just so he calls me up. Uh, but we saw, yeah, I saw him. Oh, I saw, and I saw Rick Springfield. Getting back to Rick, Rick's album came out. I got it, and uh, I'm a huge fan. I've seen him twice in the past year, and uh, and Rick Springfield. We saw him at the Universal Amphitheater, which is a small uh, theater, and uh, Rick's show is it's it's generally Housewives and me. That's that's what it that's what it is. It's Housewives and then me standing there watching Rick. And Rick Rick has a guitar around his waist, but I don't think Rick can play guitar. I Rick. Rick's guitar, because he's punching it. Like, he's not even... I don't even think he has a pick in his hand. He, You would get a better sound out of Rick Springfield's guitar if you threw it down the stairs. But I, I'm tell, it doesn't matter, because his songs are his songs, and they're awesome. I am a huge fan. Uh, we went and saw him. Karen and I went and saw him this year at a fair. He was at a county fair, he, and, and it was like a, an unadvertised deal. It was like a church fundraiser and they were like guess who's going to be here a famous 80s guy and it had a silhouette in the church bulletin and i wake up one morning and karen has printed out she went online and found the actual picture and put it next to the silhouette with just a note that's like we're going so i'm i'm i can't believe it i said all right we're, we're definitely going i mean you know <laughs> I, I i don't go to this church don't know anything about it but i know that they're gonna have rick springfield there so we're going uh, and, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure, you know, let's put it this way. We're 99% sure from the silhouette and Karen's detective work, Karen and, uh, you know, Mr. T and George Papard went and got in the van and figured out what was going to happen. So I'm like, all right, good. Uh, but I still called them. I still called the church to say, 
uh, hey, what time is the, the special guest playing? And the woman goes, you mean Rick Springfield? Yes, I do. Uh, so she said it was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. And uh, we said, great. So we wind up going to this thing. And uh, it's great because it's under a tent. And in this tent, it's uh, literally just, it's women uh, and they're, dis they're completely disinterested husbands. And then me, who's just as happy as the women are to be there. And it's just women who've been fucking the same guy for 10 years and thinking about fucking a different guy for the last eight. <laughs> believe me. And, uh, and they are sitting there with their husbands and their husbands are there in their flip flops and their trucker hats. And, uh, uh, and these women are dreaming of when they were 15 years old and they all are just, they want to climb on Rick Springfield and just sit there. That's what they want to do. And, uh, we're waiting for him to come out and it's, uh, and there's some, uh, there's some old people mixed in. I'm not going to lie to you who are just sitting there and just like, what's going on. And we're like, oh, there's going to be a concert later. Oh, I bet. Okay. They just wanted to sit down and get out of the heat. So, uh, but then, uh, uh sure enough. I asked the roadie, I'm like, how long is Rick playing? And he goes, probably an hour. And I was completely geeked for that. And, uh, and then he comes out and he plays and I'm, we were the equivalent of like sixth row in a concert. I mean, we were that close to him. And, uh, he sang with some like little kids choir and he, he, he did a half hour and these women, it was great to watch these women respond because they are just, they're screaming for him. And these are, you know, they're 40 year old women that they're, they're remembering from when they were kids and how much they love the guy. And as they're screaming, their kids will walk up and be like, mommy. And they're like, go away. Remember when you didn't exist? When I had a life, get the hell out of here. Here's a, here's a handful of tickets. Go ride the salt and pepper shakers and leave me alone. God damn it. Mommy's trying to remember when things were positive. And so Rick is singing and these women are singing along and they're just, and they're grooving and they're, and they're doing that bad white housewife dance, you know, where they're just, they're just kind of shimmying back and forth. And they're just remembering when they were young and they were in a sorority and everything had so much meaning and positivity and they didn't have to climb into their Volvo every day and drop their kids off at soccer, but they had just escaped. And, uh, and in the middle of all that is, you know, six foot two, 275 pound me going, Oh my God, Rick. <laughs> And, uh, and it's so funny. Like I, I would want to meet him, like, but I, I just don't think that would ever be like good because he's usually meeting, like I said, housewives and people like that. And to see me come barreling up, he's got to think, uh, you know, uh, that I'm either going to shoot him or, or I'm going to hug him too inappropriately. And I'm not, I'm like, not going to let him go. Like I'm one of those guys who's completely like fascinated by him. I'm not that guy. I love his music. Uh, sure. He's an incredibly amazingly good looking guy. And sure, if he wanted to jump the fence and wanted to talk to me about it, I'd have to consider it. I mean, if he, you know, if he and I are on the roof of a hotel in Sunset Boulevard, then maybe something's going to happen. But honestly, I'm just a big music guy and I love Rick's music. So uh, there you go. So, uh, yeah, it was beautiful. So I, I saw him a couple times and and, uh, and got the album. And uh, and that that's better than any old cake, as far as you know, Karen. Uh, so I was happy to get that. Uh, all right, you guys can write me at Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com. Go ahead and write me and please let me know what you think about the show. Send me some feedback and stuff. Also, leave a review on iTunes. That would be cool if you wanted to do that. A lot of people are doing it, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, letting everybody know how you feel is great. Uh, also, go ahead and go to MySpace.com slash MikeSchmidtComedy and uh, look at a picture of me with a couple of guys in leather hoods cleaning my shoes. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, but go ahead and leave, and leave me a note there at MySpace. Go to Mike at MikeSchmidtComedy.com and write me there. Uh, remember to read the communiques at MikeSchmidtComedy.com and also go to ComedyFilmNerds.com. I have nothing new there. Whoa, man. What happened to my voice there? That was I had like a weird hiccup thing happened in between right when I was saying there. That was weird. All right. So uh, so go there. I became Ted Knight. That's how I was. Go to Comedy Film Nerds. Huh? 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 You don't get nothing and like it. Uh, so yeah, go to all those places and write me and let me know what's happening. Also, if you guys are interested in never not funny season one, uh, that was the podcast I was involved in the successful podcast I was involved in before I started to do this one <laughs> and go to, uh, go to my website, go to Mike .com and click on store. And that should take you to the special thing.com store. And you can go ahead and buy the, uh, never not funny season one. It's only 20 bucks for over 60 hours of amazing entertainment. So go ahead and pick that up and uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Shoot me letters and shoot me feedback and shoot me all the things that you can do and uh, send them over there. And I, I appreciate it. I got to tell you everything that you guys leave me and send me, I I'm thrilled about it. And I go ahead and read them and check them out. And I, I do love them. And I, you know what though? I get this spam, this really weird spam on my uh, communiques. I don't know who's got it. Some guy in India or Germany or, I, or Greece, because it'll be these weird Greek letters. And I don't 
don't understand Greek. I don't. It's all Greek to me. Aha, I'm an idiot. All right, so, uh, but these people leave this spam, and uh, and I got, but then there'll be, like, really horrible, long uh, spams, and it'll say something about, you know, go to this site, and look at this, and look at that, and look at this, and it had rap videos, and uh, and I thought, it, and so when I have to hit spam, and then I have to erase it, but sometimes if you actually hit the link, you wind up going to that site, so I hit the rap video one on accident, and it turns out it was rape videos. It wasn't rap videos at all. And, uh, and then I watched the rape video, and i got to be honest with you, not that different from a rap video. Uh, the soundtrack is, is very different. There's certainly a, a, a difference there, but the uh, rape video, very, very close to a rap video. Uh, just a lot less Armani suits. That's pretty much it. A lot less Cristal. Uh, uh, and a lot more pleading, you know, because uh, there's no uh, real rap song going on. But, uh, guy i am not a good guy but i don't think i'm a bad person overall so uh and go ahead and by all means judge that i'm kind of a jag off i got the future what am i talking about but i am a jag off uh, and i'm not a jerk i'm a nice guy it's just i guess i have jerky tendencies i've done so much ridiculous stuff and then i, I wonder afterwards i'm like man how come i don't uh, hang out with anybody here's why because you're a dick Yeah, 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 yeah